Welcome to Texas Heart Institute Educational Programs, uh, Cardiology in the Time of COVID-19. Uh, in response to the evolving COVID-19 pandemic, the Texas Heart Institute is providing perspective to the healthcare community, taking care of cardiovascular patients with COVID-19. The title of today's program is The Role of Cardiac CT and FFR in Cardiac Patients During COVID-19 Pandemic. This program is presented uh, uh, together between Texas Heart Institute and uh, ISCVS or International Society of Endovascular Specialists. I'm Zwanbu Krasier. I'm an international cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and CHI Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Our special guest today is Dr. Christopher Zarens. He's a founder and senior VP for medical affairs at HeartFlow Incorporated. Welcome Dr. Zarens to Texas Heart Institute Educational Programs. Thank you, pleasure to be here. It's a special pleasure to have Dr. Zarens uh, here with us for this uh, presentation. As COVID-19 situation continues to evolve, guidance documents around elective procedures are being published daily by various entities, government bodies, professional societies, publications, and so on. Uh, numerous societies, as I have mentioned, have made recommendations and guidelines regarding treatment of patients with cardiac disease during COVID-19 epidemic. It was shown from several publications that some patients are presenting with elevated troponins and other signs of STEMI or non-STEMI or acute coronary syndromes, and they may actually have COVID-19 related myocarditis rather than coronary event, as shown in this particular publication. So it's important to know that myocarditis related to COVID-19 may complicate a diagnosis of STEMI and acute coronary symptoms. Now the advisory board uh, from uh, American College of Cardiology related to COVID-19 clinical implications for cardiovascular patients showed that cardiovascular disease is a, a significant comorbidity for COVID-19 in addition to age and other comorbid conditions as shown in this particular slide. Also, ACC and Society of Cardiac Angiography and Intervention have made the recommendations to avoid elective invasive procedures whenever possible during COVID pandemic. So, Dr. Zarens, uh, I would like to know what is your opinion? What is the role of cardiac uh, CT, angio, and FFR in the variation of patients with coronary artery disease in general? Well, thank you, Dr. Kreacher, for inviting me to participate in this very important discussion. And I, I wanted to just start by thanking all of the doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who are working so hard in this very difficult and challenging time to provide care for patients with uh, coronary artery, uh, coronary uh, virus uh, disease. Uh, so the problem of diagnosis of these patients is particularly important, especially at a time when many patients are not going to doctors, not going to hospitals, but yet are presenting with coronary disease, which as Dr. Kreacher indicated, sometimes is indistinguishable from the symptoms of the COVID-19 virus itself. So in thinking about coronary CT, first of all, we have to recognize how good a test it is. It is the best diagnostic test there is to find out whether or not you have coronary artery disease. It clearly shows you the coronary arteries themselves, shows you the lumen caliber, shows you plaque and, and the complications of plaque, such as calcifications and, and uh, plaque uh, abnormalities. Uh, and it also tells you about uh, long-term prognosis as shown on this slide. Importantly, patients who have no 
significant coronary disease on cardiac CT have an excellent long-term prognosis. Some people say eight to 10 years warranty. And people with non-obstructive coronary disease, the CADRADS level one and two as shown in green, also have a good prognosis. The patients who have problems are those with obstructive coronary artery disease. And the extent and severity of disease is directly linked to adverse events. And in the short term, which is what we're considering now in the coronavirus uh, uh, era, uh, what do we do with these patients? Well, normally when a patient presents with symptomatic coronary disease and has a positive significant obstructive disease CT scan, they're sent to the cath lab. But that, of course, is a difficult decision in a time when we're trying to contain, uh, contain the risk, both for the patients and for healthcare workers, and to reduce invasive procedures that may not be needed uh, in the hospitals. So how do we do this? So let's look at the Oh, one, one thing that we need to remember, as we'll see on the next slide, it's important to remember that when we're talking about CT stenosis, there's a disparity between the anatomic stenosis that we see on the CT scan and the functional significance of that stenosis. Now, the functional significance of coronary lesions can be defined in the cath lab by measuring fractional flow reserve. And we know that visual interpretation of coronary angiograms do not correlate well with the estimates of stenosis. In the FAME trial, patients with 50 to 70% lumen stenosis, 65% of those patients had negative FFRs, that is not functionally significant lesions. Even in patients with 70 to 90% stenosis, 20% had non-functional disease. So therefore, it's important to know about the functional significance of disease. And we can see in coronary CT, the same relationships exist. On the left side of the screen, we can see that for a 30 to 50% stenosis, one out of three patients will not have a functionally significant lesion. In the 50 to 70% range, one out of two patients will not have a functionally significant lesion. So this is an intermediate stenosis group that perhaps uh, really needs special attention. Even in a group with 70 to 90% stenosis, one out of four patients uh, will uh, have normal or L, uh, normal FFRs and not have functionally significant disease. So Chris, uh, of course, uh CT for the relation of coronary disease has existed for a long period of time. And for a very long period of time, it was considered not to be a very sensitive tool. So really, uh, what has changed dr dramatically, the sensitivity, specificity, and usefulness of CT is the introduction of FFR. Can you uh, tell us uh, how did this evolve and what were the algorithms used to make this uh, test so sensitive and so reliable? So coronary CT scans are actually very sensitive in finding disease. They have a very uh, high negative predictive value and very high sensitivity. They're not very specific so that a lot of patients who are found to have disease that looks significant on CT actually have non-functionally significant disease. and. Uh, we have been looking at the relationship between hemodynamics and atherosclerosis for many, many years. For over a 25-year period at Stanford University, we were uh, looking at uh, coronary uh, at blood flow in arteries based on human CT scans. These really started with aortas and the problem of aortic aneurysms and stent grafts, because in treating aneurysms and stent grafts, uh, a CT scan is the uh, workhorse for diagnosis and planning treatments. In 2005, when um, coronary CT came available with 64 slice scanners, we for the first time were able to see the coronary arteries, not just aortas and carotids. 
we then started doing computational analysis of blood flow in the coronary arteries. And when the FAME studies came out proving that FFR guided revascularization was better than visual guided revascularization, we then focused on coronary artery flow modeling. And applying the principles of computational fluid dynamics, we could then compute fractional flow reserve. Now, as you know, fractional flow reserve is measured in the cath lab by giving adenosine with maximum coronary blood flow uh, drug induced, adenosine induced. In computational analysis, we simulate the maximum coronary blood flow by reducing peripheral resistance. That then allows us to calculate the pressure gradient across lesions under simulated maximum flow conditions, i.e. computed fractional flow reserve. The problem of all our calculations was we really didn't know if it worked. So in 2009, we actually began comparing our computed values to measured values in the cath lab with fractional flow reserve. And many, many studies now have proved the accuracy of computed analysis so that a computed fractional flow reserve is very well reflected by the measured values in the same patients in the same lesions. So uh, it's interesting. Uh, this would not have been po uh, possible without introduction of artificial intelligence and finding uh, the right log logarithm to be able to uh, algorithm to be able to figure out exactly how to get meaningful data out of this imp this study. Well, that's a very good point because we incorporate uh, deep learning into our algorithm so that the more information we have with increasing knowledge from each subsequent CT scan, we validate that against measured FFR and we can use that information to improve the subsequent models. So it's a continuous cycle of improvement uh, so that um, the accuracy of our analyses uh, is always validated against measured FFR. And uh, Stanford is well known for development of artificial intelligence in medicine. I think it was one of the first institutions that actually initiated pretty extensive program in radiology, but in also in medicine in general. Is that correct? That's correct. And Stanford also has been a, a leader in imaging in magnetic resonance imaging and CT imaging and introducing uh, patient-specific modeling. Uh, and that, as I mentioned, uh, began with uh, modeling of aneurysms and aorta and then went on to the coronary arteries. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, FFR, CT, and interactive uh, model results. So CT-derived fractional flow reserve really begins with standard cardiac CT scans. These are the same CT scans that are performed every day in hospitals. The CT scan is uploaded through a secure web-based interface to our servers at HeartFlow using special software which integrates artificial intelligence and deep learning. Trained technicians develop the digital three-dimensional model of the coronary artery trees. We then apply the principles of computational fluid dynamics to compute coronary blood flow and to calculate fractional flow reserve at all points in the coronary tree. This is then delivered to the hospitals in several formats. One is a print PDF format, which can be printed. The second is an interactive format, which can be accessed with your iPhone or iPad or on your hospital computer, so that remote access and interrogation of these models are possible and physicians can now uh, themselves see and evaluate the direct results of the analysis. The mean turnaround time is, a, is less than four hours to receive the results back in the hospital. So if in this time of COVID-19, if you are not in the hospital working remotely, you can send a patient to the CT scanner and then receive the results of the analysis and communicate with the physician. This could all be then potentially remotely without in-person 
uh, interaction with the patient. This is a simulation of what you may see on your iPhone. This is not an exact uh, patient study, but it shows that you can click on the model at any point and you can derive an FFR value. The red color is a positive FFR less than 0.8, and the green, blue and the green is a normal value. You can do pullback pressures on that, and you can see significance of lesions. You can use those interactive models to plan treatments and to help guide decision making. This example shows the anatomic functional mismatch that we sometimes see. There are two patients with 70% stenosis by CT. You can see the computational models. One of them shows a non-significant lesion with FFR point, FCT of 0.86, and this correlates very well with the angiogram and a measured FFR of 0.87. The second patient has a similar lesion on CT, but this is now a very positive lesion color-coded red, you see the FFR value is 0 0.70. And when that is compared now with the measured FFR value in the cath lab, it is 0 0.71. So what looks like a pretty similar lesion on CT is very different on the functional level. And even if you look at these angiograms, it's hard to be sure just looking at the visual angiogram which one is positive. But when you measure FFR, or compute FFR, the difference is very, very clear, and it really can help guide patient treatment. This is very interesting because uh, very frequently performing a geography, we uh, <clears throat> misinterpret the severity of the disease, and there is a tremendous variability between uh, the operators on assessing the severity of the disease. So I think uh, this really exemplifies uh, the importance of reliable and sensitive uh, tests uh, to give us the information which lesion is significant and which lesion is not significant. The, the, other thing, the other thing that's important is that in the computed FFR, you get FFR values at all points in the coronary tree. You can interrogate all the vessels in that, from that one single model. When you measure FFR in the cath lab, you measure it at one point wherever the pressure wire happens to be in the artery. You can do pullback pressures, but it's a more complicated, more time-consuming procedure to interrogate the entire arterial tree with uh, measured FFR. Very interesting. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, diagnostic accuracy of a variety of non-invasive uh, assessment of coronary disease. Of course, we have uh, many different uh, tools available. Now, uh, PET is very commonly used and it's thought to be very sensitive coronary, CTA, SPECT, and heart flow, FFR. And what kind of a uh, diagnostic accuracy do we have? And how does uh, uh, heart flow FFR compare to the other modalities that we commonly use? Well, that's a very important question. And diagnostic accuracy uh, is really predicated on functional significance of lesions. And that is, as we've been talking about, measured by FFR. So the diagnostic accuracy of computed FFR compared directly to measured FFR was done in the NXT trial and that showed an 86% diagnostic accuracy. The other non-invasive tests such as PET, coronary CT, and SPECT um, uh, have been tested uh, against FFR in the Pacific trial run by Paul Knappen. And in that trial, in comparison to those non-invasive modalities, with a sub-analysis comparing to heart flow FFRCT, we found that the highest diagnostic accuracy, that is the highest area under the curve of an ROC curve, was for FFRCT with an AUC of 0.94. This was significantly better than PET, coronary CT, or SPECT. We know that of all people going to the cath lab for diagnostic angiography, more than 50%, probably close to 60% uh, 
have normal coronary angiograms, that is non-obstructive disease. So in retrospect, you might say, well, why did they need to go to the cath lab if they don't have significant disease? So the same experience that we found in the platform trial now has been found in many other institutions in the world. That is the cancellation rate of angiography after FFRCT analysis. And overall, it's around 50% of patients. So that you can now reduce the negative catheterization rate in the cath lab by doing CT and FFRCT. So what does this mean? Well, this means that you can have more efficient use of the cath lab. So patients now are going to the cath lab, not in order to get a diagnosis, but in order to get treatment. So if you identify patients ahead of time that they in fact have a significant lesion that needs to be treated, your average cat revascularization rate goes up. And that's in fact what happens if you look at these hospitals. And from multiple reports here, we see that without CT, FFR, CT, the average rate of revascularization of all patients in the lab is about 34%. But once you start using CT, FFR, CT, the revascularization rate is 69% so that the patients in the cath lab are getting revascularized. This is particularly important in the, in the uh, era of COVID-19 because you don't want patients now in the in high intensity cath labs. The patients themselves might contaminate the cath lab or patients coming into the hospital um, might become contaminated because of uh, all the COVID patients are in hospitals now. So that in order to improve the efficiency, safety, and effectiveness of the cath lab, pre-cath evaluation with not only an, an anatomic test like CT, but a functional test like FFRCT helps you sort out who does and who does not need to be in the cath lab. So was this just in that one study or is this a more generalized phenomenon? In a real world ex, uh, experience, a registry, the advanced registry of more than 4,700 patients uh, in 38 sites across the world, the same dynamics occurred. 63% of the patient management decisions were altered once FFRCT uh, data was available. And importantly, and this is perhaps one of the most important observations here, is that patients who have FFRCT of greater than 0.8 that is, they do not have hemodynamically significant lesions, even though they may have many, many plaques, they're not functionally significant. They do very, very well on medical treatment. Patients whose FFRs are less than 0.8, they have more disease, they need treatment, they need intervention, and overall, over, uh, their cardiovascular death and MI rate is higher. But, Additional studies by Norgard in Denmark show that it, those who now get treated with intervention do better. So this really helps decision making, helps guide treatment, and has improved outcome for patients. So what have we learned from all those studies that uh, <clears throat> were carried on using uh, CT and FFR? Well, we, we show that it's a really good diagnostic strategy. It's a good diagnostic strategy because you can exclude significant coronary disease. And many patients come in with symptoms thinking they have coronary disease, may have classic symptoms, but actually don't have significant disease. They have something else. Uh, FFR CT analysis can identify which one of those patients with the disease has significant disease, ischemia producing coronary stenosis, that may benefit from treatment. So you can differentiate patients who are best treated medically from patients who may benefit from a trip to the cath lab. The other important thing to learn here, especially in this COVID-19 era, is that this is a treatment strategy, diagnostic and treatment strategy that can be done with a single point of patient contact. That is a CT scan. You don't need second tests. You don't need hands-on uh, uh, interactions in, in high intensity areas in the hospital. You can get a CT scan. This can be done even in outpatient basis. 
And from the CT scan data, you can now get the functional information. You can sort out which patients have significant disease and which patients should be treated medically. Uh, and uh, this can be done remotely if necessary. If the risk of bringing a patient into the office or, or into the hospital for consultation is too high because of risk of COVID-19, you can communicate remotely. Uh, and uh, if a patient does indeed have significant disease that is life-threatening, that patient then can be scheduled and brought into the high-intensity facility for uh, treatment. So this is a benefit, reducing exposure to risk to patients and healthcare personnel and provides more efficient utilization of resources. Uh, personal protective uh, uh, equipment is lessened and we can use the cath lab for treatment rather than for diagnosis. All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about um, COVID-19 and the use of this uh, test, uh, how to uh, streamline and triage patients who need intervention and patients who need, don't need, need intervention. And uh, uh, CMS also made some recommendations. Can you go through it a little bit with us, please? So the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released guidance on March 17, asking healthcare providers to postpone adult elective surgeries and procedures, including dental procedures, until further notice. CMS recommended decisions about procedures to be made in consultation with a hospital surgeon, patient, and other healthcare professionals. And the, the chart made up this, the, the agency made up this chart to guide decision making. Uh, so you can see elective procedures are postponed, but you do not postpone high acuity, acuity emergency procedures. These are acutely symptomatic patients. These are patients who may die if treatment is withheld. Importantly, perhaps patient with a left main disease, patient with a, a, a critical ischemia producing left main disease, which uh, sudden death is not an unusual occurrence. So there are patients who on the basis of symptoms and presentations are urgent and should not be postponed. And of course, it's the physicians in judgment to make the decision, does someone have such a lethal disease? There are exceptions for cancers. There are exceptions for patients with life-threatening conditions, including significant coronary disease, which as you know, is the number one cause of death in the world. So, so I think uh, the CTA first pathway is a very important pathway uh, because it allows definitive diagnosis of symptomatic patients who need cardiac testing. A CTA first strategy uh, allows you to answer the first important question, does this patient have coronary disease or does this patient not have coronary disease? If the patient does not have coronary disease, that patient could be very well treated medically as appropriate. If the patient has anything between 30 and 90% stenosis, that could be a patient that you may want to get an FFRCT evaluation to determine uh, whether or not this is hemodynamically significant ischemia producing. Uh, so this strategy can be done without excess contact with the patient other than the initial CT uh, itself. So this can reduce the need for diagnostic angiograms, alleviate the burden to hospitals and healthcare facilities, and minimize negative cath procedures. It allows you to risk stratify patients, enabling you to select patients for revascularization, and only referring patients who are at the highest risk uh, to the immediate use of the cath lab with the remainder of patients can be deferred. Of so course, we'll all of these decisions are made on the basis of doctor-patient interaction, communication, and the judgment of the physician based on the symptoms of the patient. So obviously, I'm sure 
a lot of interventionalists would have, um, or those that take care of patients with acute uh, coronary syndromes, questions for you related to uh, several important issues that we have to deal with on a regular basis. Number one is um, how many institutions are able to uh, perform good quality CTAs uh, and uh, how reliable those uh, tests are to be able to get a meaningful uh, FFR uh, data that will be obtained, uh, you know, from uh, the <clears throat> uh, hard flow analysis. Well, that's, that's an important question because the uh, heart flow analysis is dependent on a good high quality CT scan. Uh, and the CT scan imagers of today are fully capable of producing high quality CT images. Now, coronary, uh, I'm not a cardiac CT expert, but uh, so you, you need to consult with them. But a couple of things that are important. One is when you image for coronary CT for heart flow analysis, it's important to follow the strict society guidelines, including heart rate control. This will uh, cause great improvements in image quality. Ideally, heart rates of 60 or less are, are uh, hoped for. Uh, and to give coronary vasodilators, such as nitrates, just before the CT scan. The reason that is important is because uh, coronary arteries that are not dilated will give an abnormal reading. In the cath lab, when they measure fractional flow reserve, they give um, nitroglycerin vasodilators. So the comparison of FFR to computed FFR has to be on the basis of the same anatomy, that is not constricted coronaries, but dilated coronaries. So following SCCT guidelines for coronary acquisition, the machines, no matter which kind of 64 slice or greater machine you have is capable of good quality CT images. Now there are situations, sometimes the patient moves. Uh, one feature that is talked about a lot is calcification. Now calcification interferes with image uh, reading the quality of the images because of calcium blooming. Uh, it's been shown that FFRCT analysis is possible even in calcified arteries with good quality results. So uh, care in CT imaging, training the technician, dedicated technician, following the protocols, careful attention to the process of image acquisition should allow most every place that offers cardiac CT to uh, perform heart flow analysis if they wish. Now, this could be a, a potential problem in a patient in the COVID era. A lot of those patients, whether they have COVID or they don't have it, but they have, let's say, cardiac symptoms and hemodynamic instability, it is very difficult to, uh, to control the heart rate and bring the heart rate down uh, and they might have tachycardia or atrial fibrillation and rapid ventricular response. They might be hypotensive where nitroglycerin cannot be administered. So either we cannot do this study for that particular reason or it will be suboptimal. And uh, is that of concern? Yeah, yes, it certainly is. And um, FFRCT analysis is indicated for stable patients not patients with recent MIs. If there's been a myocardial infarction within 30 days, uh, there's no evidence to show that this is uh, uh, useful. So, so this is for patients with same stable symptomatic uh, disease, suspected coronary disease with stable symptoms, not for acute patients uh, with uh, acute instability being admitted with acute coronary syndromes. Well, I understand that. I was not trying to uh, <clears throat> point this towards acute coronary syndrome, but point towards the patient that admitted with possible COVID infection 
and symptoms. Symptoms could be due to many different reasons, whether they are febrile or have respiratory issues and so on. So I'm trying to figure out how we can make this uh, beneficial and useful and safe in this type of a scenario. Well, this is where, where uh, the physicians need to get together to establish protocols within the hospital of how to manage patients uh, uh, and to prepare them properly for CT if they wish to pre perform CT. And this is a very important question that really needs to be looked at and addressed at each, each institution. Uh, one, one group of patients, of course, is the, in the emergency room. Patients come in with uh, symptoms and uh, uh, may have symptoms that are very suggestive of uh, acute coronary syndrome, even though they are stable. Uh, and there need to be protocols in place. Uh, this requires uh, the CT scanner being ready with trained technicians who can do uh, proper quality uh, CT scan and systems in place for data acquisition. Uh, prompt reading of the study to determine whether or not there's a 30 to 90% lesion, and then a uh, uh, system in place where those images then are uploaded to heart flow so that the results can be returned. So uh, what, what else can we expect in the future as far as uh, heart flow uh, technology is concerned? Of course, it takes up to four hours or maybe sometimes longer to uh, get the reading. And uh, sometimes we don't have that luxury to be able to wait that long. So do you foresee in the future where artificial intelligence might lead us even further in being able to get this data in a shorter period of time? We are certainly working on that. And <clears throat> the uh, analysis times and the capabilities uh, are getting shorter all the time. Uh, they will never get to zero, of course, uh, but uh, uh, we are working on that uh, in order to uh, reduce uh, turnaround time to get the reports back as quickly as possible. Uh, certainly patients with um, relatively uh, straightforward disease can be done more quickly than patients with complex multivessel calcified uh, lesions, so that requires a little bit more time. Um, but overall, the process is getting faster. Well, Dr. Zerens, thank you very much for your very valuable contribution to Texas Art Institute educational programs in a COVID-19 epidemic. We are greatly appreciative of this information that you have provided to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and good luck to uh, all the uh, healthcare workers in this difficult time.